I'm Nathan, and welcome to Stories with a Twang. For today's episode, I have two exciting stories for you, so sit back and relax. Our first story is called Don't Go to the Sorcière Hotel by Crimson Durian. A few years ago, I was on a trip to Manhattan Island. Being the idiot I am, I left my cash and some of my luggage in a taxi. I was stranded in the middle of New York and I needed to find a hotel quickly. Luckily, there was one right next to where I was. It had a neon sign that said the Sorcier Hotel. As I approached it, I immediately knew that something was off. The hotel was a dingy tourist trap. Everything had some yellowish dirt on it and the walls looked like they hadn't been painted in years. I came up to the receptionist and asked for a room. I was repulsed by his strange smile. He gave me some keys and asked for my credit card. When I gave it to him, he swiped it and handed it back to me. I tried pulling it from his hand, but he wouldn't let go. I had to use a good amount of force to grab it back. I'm sorry, this is my first day, is what he said. He asked, can I carry your luggage? I didn't say anything, but he grabbed it anyway. He was odd, but he wasn't nearly as strange as the rest of the place. I went to use the elevator, but there was none. I sighed and went up the stairs. When I went to put my hand on the handrail, I noticed that it was coated in some sort of translucent goop. When I finally got to my door, I opened it and noticed that there was a man in my room. I asked, what are you doing here? He said, I'm just checking the room, sir, and left. While he was leaving, I got a detailed glimpse of his facial features. He was a pale man with an almost cartoonishly long face. Unlike the rest of the employees who were smiling, he had a nonchalant expression. I would say that he looked almost depressed. I jumped onto my bed and noticed that my luggage was already in my room. I thought that this was strange as I didn't see the receptionist come up the stairs with me. At this point, I wanted to leave. I thought, just one night. When I put my head on my pillow, I noticed that something was under it. I looked and it was a dead rat. I was disgusted. I called room service and I told them about it. They cleaned it up and I asked where it came from. A man with a large smile on his face said, Accidents happen. We are sorry. And left. I would have left, but it was 2 a.m. and I didn't have the energy. I was thinking, this day can't get any worse. It did. I tried to go to sleep, but I couldn't. This place was just too weird. At about 3 a.m., my doorbell rang. I looked through the peephole and saw the pale man who was in my room earlier. I opened the door and he said to me, Hello, I am the owner, Gustavo. I've heard that you found a dead rat under your pillow. I replied, Yes, what about it? He told me, I'd like to give you some compensation. How about a night for free? I was about to say something when he left abruptly. What was wrong with these stupid people? While I was trying to sleep, I could hear fighting from the other room. It sounded like two people were trying to kill each other. I could hear loud noises of somebody being slammed against a wall. After a few minutes of this, I heard intense screaming. I didn't care how tired I was, I was going to leave now. As I went to the door, I saw something through the peephole. It kind of looked like a human but with ten fingers on each hand, rough and colorless skin, and purely white eyes. Its mouth was wide open, exposing its sharp teeth that were covered in blood. I stumbled back and hid under my sheets. That's all I could do at this point. At around 6 a.m., I was going to leave this place no matter what. I got out of bed, opened my door, and bolted out. I was running down the stairs when I tripped. Gustavo helped me up and said, Leaving so soon, you have another night for free. I escaped his grip and ran to the main lobby. There were at least 50 employees in here and they were all standing in a circle. When I came in, they all looked at me with their freaky smiles. At the same time, they all said, Leaving so soon, you have another night for free. They chanted this over and over while I ran out the door. When I got outside, I felt a sense of relief. I called the police and told them what had happened. They went to check the hotel, but it was gone. In its place was an old apartment building that hadn't been used in decades. If anybody has experience with the Sorcier Hotel, please tell me. We need to uncover this mystery.
Our last story this week is called Something Has Scared the Wolves by Lucas Fields. I work as a volunteer in a wolf sanctuary up in the Pacific Northwest. It's a fairly small establishment and a fairly young one too. We started during the 2010s and we kept going as a small but determined group of people. We take things seriously and we live by our desire to help these majestic beasts. The sanctuary stands on a pretty remote spot, completely surrounded by forest. We like the thought of keeping our animals as close as possible to their habitat. And this position also lets us keep track fairly easy of the wolves we set free after the rescue. It isn't an easy life by any means, but we've managed to adjust to it, some more than others. For me, these forests really feel like home. And once we got our cabin up and running with electricity and internet, I stopped caring about my life in the nearby town. I had all I wanted right there among the trees. However, for the sake of everyone's mental well-being, we take turns staying here. No more than two weeks, no less than two people. The woods can really strain your mind, and that's not optimal when your daily routine revolves around caring for wild animals that can easily weigh more than 100 pounds and could potentially tear you to shreds in mere seconds. This time, it was me and Oliver's turn. It was a pretty chill time. Oliver is amazing at his job. The weather was nice despite low temperatures and our residents were absolutely lovely. By residents, I mean four wonderful specimens of northwestern gray wolves, rescued as pups and raised by us in captivity. Four wonderful females, Artemis, Tia, Ice, and Dawn. They are a considerable amount of work, but it's really worth it. So, as I was saying, things were going pretty smooth. Then, yesterday morning, one of the GPS devices we used to track rescued wolves sent out a signal. Nothing really out of the ordinary. This signal, in particular, lets us know that the device has not been moved at all in the last 24 hours. It could mean that the animal is hurt, but most times it simply means that the device has somehow detached from the collar of the wolf and needs to be recovered. So, Oliver decided to go and check it out. The day went on as usual until early afternoon. Oliver contacted me via radio, stating that he was rushing back to camp. I could hear his voice being a little different, less composed and calm than usual. About 20 minutes later, he rolled into the front of the sanctuary with our pickup. Man, you gotta take a look at this, he said, getting off the vehicle in a hurry. As I approached the back of the pickup where Oliver was standing, I could immediately feel the pungent smell of rotting flesh. Oliver said nothing, he just stared down, eventually covering his nose. On the back of the pickup lay the corpse of a wolf we rescued months back. His beautiful black fur ruffled, his eyes and mouth wide open, and three huge slashes on the side of his body. Those are way too big, I remember thinking instinctively. We tried to assess the situation with Oliver back in the hut. He decided to drive back to town before sundown so he could get the carcass to the local vet in the hope of getting some answers. He proposed to ask someone to come over and cover him for the night, but I assured him I would be just fine. He left shortly after, leaving me alone with the wolves, who were wandering around their pen, probably alerted by the strong smell of death still faintly present in the air. I finished my tasks for the day, preparing some canned soup for dinner and ate it straight out of the can while trying to wrap my head around the wounds on that wolf. I had never seen anything like it, and a quick check in the sanctuary's archive revealed that something like this had just never happened before. It was common to find dead wolves, but it was way less common to find massacred ones. Just as I was skimming through all our reports, I realized that one of the wolves was loudly growling outside. A weird behavior for sure. I looked out the window and it was Artemis, on the far side of the pen, right at the fence, growling at the dark tree line just ahead. I found it extremely weird for her to do such a thing. I grabbed my flashlight and headed outside. I could see my breath and I realized that the evening air had gotten slightly colder than usual. I made my way to the fence, opened the gate, and squeezed myself in. Tia, Ice, and Dawn came out of their enclosures and quickly made their way around me. Now this wasn't unusual per se, but the way they kept their posture low was. They were clearly alarmed by something. I called for Artemis to no avail. 
She just kept on growling at seemingly nothing. In the air, the same rotting smell was still present, if not even stronger than before. This couldn't have been possible. The whole situation gave me a gut feeling like no other. I couldn't put my finger on it, but I was feeling exposed. Part of me wanted to get the wolves and crawl back into the hut with them, clearly not the brightest train of thought. I slowly made my way to Artemis. When I placed my hand on her back, she stopped growling and started softly whimpering to me, briefly looking at me before staring back in the dark. She seemed relieved. I flashed my light in the dark, nothing but trees, no movement, anything at all. The wolves didn't cut back on their alerted state though. They were still scared by something. I started taking them back to the enclosures and locking them in. As I was closing Tia's door, Dawn started growling too, immediately followed by ice from inside of her enclosure. My unease was starting to spiral out of control, so I hurried the whole process. Once the doors were locked, I started walking back to the hut, but then I realized how silent the whole place had become. Dead silence, all around. Then, a faint shuffling, some twigs breaking. My heart sank. It came right from where Artemis was growling. I stood there like a deer in the headlight, pondering my options. I decided to check once again, just to be sure before going back to the hut as fast as possible, closing the door, closing all the shutters, and just trying to get some sleep. I walked slowly, flashlight in my right hand, pointing the beam left and right. Then I saw them, two eyes in the darkness shining back at me, two amber dots about a foot from the ground, the eyes of a wolf? As I kept on staring at them, wondering what was going on, something impossible happened. Without breaking eye contact, the dots started lifting up, and up, and up. When they stopped, they stood among the pine trees, about ten feet high, before vanishing. I kept hearing twigs breaking before silence fell back around me. That was it. I darted back to the hut, closing every damn shutter and bolting the doors. I stood there in complete darkness, and in complete silence hardly getting any sleep at all. As I write this, the sun is way up in the sky, but I still can't shake off the dreadful feeling those eyes cast it upon me. The wolves seem to be fine, and Oliver should be returning later today. This forest felt like my home. Today, I don't feel so sure about that anymore. All right, everyone, that's it for this week's stories. I really hope you all enjoyed them as much as I did. I would like to give a gigantic thanks to this week's authors, Crimson Durian and Lucas Fields. Let me know if you would like to hear more stories from these two amazing authors. If you have any stories you would like me to read on the show, you can send them over to storieswithatwang at gmail.com. You can find the show on Facebook and Instagram at Stories with a Twang Podcast. You can also listen to the show on YouTube at Stories with a Twang Podcast. It would mean an awful lot if you could rate and review the show wherever you listen, and don't forget to share with your friends and family. I'll be back next time with some more stories, but until then, have a great week, and remember that a little twang goes a long way.